A Dyson handheld vac. Why a photo? Well, a photo because I haven't actually got one. But what I have got is this. This is the battery out of a Dyson handheld vac, which has been given to me, of course, because it doesn't work properly. If I press the trigger button, then what we find is we get the dreaded red flashes of death. This battery has actually switched itself off to prevent damage. Some people claim that this is just a way of producing e-waste, but to me these things are very dangerous. What I'm trying to do then is to sum up what I found on the internet about these cells, uh, or these batteries should I say. Some of the videos I've watched I find horrendous. These things have what's called the battery management system. This isn't the one off a Dyson, it's a replacement. But this thing is there for a purpose, and that is to prevent fires. I've seen lots of videos of scooter batteries which use the same sort of cells as these, going up in flames. Things where you have your vapes, they're going up in flames as well. So these things to me are essentially uh, some sort of bomb, a sort of incendiary device, which once it's lit or catches fire, you're going to have great difficulty in putting out. Add to that the fact that it gives off nasty chemicals and fumes, then they're not something I think to be messed with. We find people on videos doing all sorts of things. One particular guy has taken it apart and as he's got part way apart, he's got it to this stage where he's got the cells on the inside. This part won't come off. So he puts this end into uh, a vice. Now a vice, of course, is electrically conducting one side to the other. Could be argued it's perfectly safe because it's got these nice rubber strips down the side. But even so, it sort of frightens me. Other people find that the battery management system has got a covering on it. I think it might be silicon, something like that. So while it's still connected to the cells, it tries to remove this with a screwdriver. Not exactly my cup of tea. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to take a pack apart anyway. Um, never mind the danger. To do it, basically, it has six sort of clips on it and a screw, the screw up at the top here. I've already undone these because they're really difficult to get off. One of the easiest ways to do it is to take a piece of thin plastic and push it where each of the clips are, leaving the plastic there then as you move round and that then will release the clips and we should be able to take the thing apart. Now, as I say, this is an incendiary device and I am most worried about it. Anyway, so there we have it. At this end, if I take this end off, if it'll come, it's going to go bang, isn't it, and not come. There we are. There, that's come. We find we've got four wires coming onto the upright part of the battery case. Uh, these then are two to the switch and two to the battery charger. The battery charger here is very difficult to get apart. Oh dear, what have I done? I think the switch might have come off. This comes off very easily when we pull it apart and there's a spring underneath so it goes poying into the air if we're not careful. The cells themselves then are arranged in series, that is this could be 0 volts, that's going to be about 4 volts, that then connects to that one and comes to here where we have 8 volts, that connects to this one, goes to there where we have 12 volts and so on on the way up. Uh, till we get to the other end which is the positive end. So we can see that the negative and positive have quite thick uh, pieces 
of, well, it should be nickel, I assume on a Dyson battery it will be, but on another it's probably going to be some nickel coated or something like that. So that's it. So what did I do when I got it apart? Well, the idea was to look to see what is actually going on. And so I connected uh, voltmeters onto the onto the cells, individual cells. Now the voltmeters themselves then are tiny devices that take power from the cells, but hopefully we can see the sort of voltages that I were getting, which was as high as four point something. You can't see the whole of the numbers because of the speed of the refresh on the batteries but we've got a couple of cells here that are at four and then one here that's down at 3.8 so the cells aren't balanced and that probably is why we've got the red flashing light because according to people on the net as soon as you get 300 millivolts difference between two cells this battery shuts down in my opinion that's a safety feature and isn't just there to create e-waste, although some people seem to think it is. So I measured the voltages, put the different voltages on, recharged the cells, looking at the amount of charge that I put into each one. Due to the fact that they got different discharge, this one took about 1800 milliamp hours to charge it whereas this one only took 771. I made a mistake here and must have knocked the charging wire off or something like that so it only got to 3.8 volts but after I reconnected it so this is my uh, battery this is the volts and this is reconnecting it. Of course charging these cells is difficult because they're in series we can either only charge one cell at a time or we need a special charger where each cell is insulated from the next cell. The charger insulates each cell from the next one. So the charger itself doesn't connect to the next charger. Anyway, so I managed to do that, recharged them all, got them back up to voltage, but once again found that we still had the red light. Assume this is because people would, uh, Dyson wants to stop people fiddling with its uh, cells, recharging them and then selling them on to other people. Because these things really are quite dangerous and Dyson wants to have a good reputation. So if your cell's gone or your battery's gone, what can you do? Well, one thing is to go out and buy a replacement cell off eBay or somewhere like that. Uh, really, I'm frightened of these things. Must be very careful. Uh, so there is a selection off eBay. I'm not recommending these. In fact, I'm saying I don't think they're a good idea. A lot of people have bought them and found that they'd have been cheaper buying a new Dyson at the moment, a V7, which is no longer made, I understand, but you can get a new battery for £65, which basically is three of these copies, and many people have found that the copies don't last that long anyway, so they'd have been better off buying a proper Dyson one. Add to that that these copies try to say that they're 900, 9,000 milliamp hours or 9 amp hours when such a thing, as far as I can see, is quite impossible. When we look at a, an 18650 cell, we're going to see that that's maximum rated at 3,600 milliamp hours. Or if they use a larger cell, the 21700, its maximum is going to be 48. So there's no way that we're going to get 9 amp hours out of one of these. A guy who did a looked at these on the internet, uh, looked at these non-Dyson ones, found that they were only really rated at 2 amp hours uh, when they were advertised at 4 amp hours. Add to that the fact that some of them were only 3C in other words, the current they could give out was only three times the 
amp hours and that just gave them 6 amps so it wasn't going to do well on a 16 amp which is needed for the V7 so you have all these things that are problems and difficulties and of course the other thing on eBay you've always got to watch for is 6.99 well actually the 6.99 isn't for the battery of course it's for the filters so the six pound bit is for filters and the 34 pounds is for the battery so yeah that's uh, the sort of thing that you can do another idea that people sell is an adapter so that uh, we can plug in uh, drill battery or some other battery into the base of the Dyson so they sell this adapter piece the battery just slides in but of course you've got to recharge this using its own charger not the Dyson charger and also they don't fit very well so it'll no longer stand up because this is protruding downwards and it won't go back into its holder because this is in the way. So there another alternative. Another alternative then is to go out and buy one of these replacement voltage battery pack devices. Whether we'd want to trust one of these or not, I'm not too sure. It does have some nice chips on it. It has a enhanced P-channel MOSFET, which I assume drives a couple of N-channel MOSFETs. But the whole thing just seems to be controlled by a simple, well, by a, not simple, microcontrollers aren't simple, but controlled by a microcontroller here, which doesn't seem to have any sort of numbers on it, so I can't trace it. Yeah, so that's the sort of alternatives. Although there is one more alternative, which is given by a guy called Tim Fever. Uh, he's written a new code to be able to program the existing uh, battery management system. To do that then he uses one of these, a programmer called the Pick Kit 3. The Pick Kit 3 then connects onto the battery management board and to your computer. So if we look at this then, what we've got is our computer. Perhaps we have a better diagram here. Not so. Uh, here's another diagram of that then. You have your computer. That goes through a USB cable to the PIC kit. The PIC kit then connects to the battery management system by these wires here. Uh, and that then enables us to reprogram the chip the microcontroller the 16LF1847 microcontroller on the battery and this thing then stores information in an EEPROM e -E uh, which stores the battery management error codes. He's managed to be able to look at what these error codes are and produce a Python uh, program which will explain what they're doing. It's in the EEPROM that the code is stored once the battery is dead. So once it's got it in here there's not a great deal that can be done to resurrect these boards. There's also there of course the microcontroller talks to the battery management system and that's what controls the batteries. Uh, although a little word of warning, someone here who followed the instructions, everything worked for reprogramming the battery management, but as they were removing one of the wires, they managed to touch a component on the board. That then meant that components started getting hot some of the surface mounted components around the positive contact started getting hot and abnormally hot probably due to a shorting component following the error of touching it so next time it's going to be a lot more careful 
he had to take, remove the SMD components on the positive contact side, which probably means then that the solder was actually melting on the board. Luckily for him then, the cells didn't catch fire and start igniting. Yeah, so a very interesting type of board. Something, as I say, that frightens me. I don't think it's for the faint-hearted to start taking these apart. And they do need treating with a great deal of care. So I've learnt a lot about it. Hopefully this summary will help other people. Uh, another thing perhaps we ought to look at before we go is the actual uh, data about the cells. So for example we have the four, four models here. V7, V8, V10 and V11. The V7 and V8 have th six cells in them, whereas the V10 and V11 have seven cells. This then means that the uh, different output currents are possible. With the V7 it only had 2.1 amp hour battery capacity, whereas the V11 had a 3.6 amp hour capacity. Nothing like the 9 that is advertised on eBay. If we look at this then we have two powers, uh, some of a third power, but if we just look at the minimum the V7 is going to give us about 20 minutes at about 6.3 amps, but on high power it'll only give 6 minutes which is what's called 8C. In other words this is 8 times the individual capacity of the, each cell. Uh, it's similar sort of thing apart from for the V11 which seems to have 12C uh, sorry, six, where am I? 6C and will last for sort of 12 minutes somebody measured it at. Uh, if we look at the charging rate, three and a half hours on the V7 up to 4.5 on the V11 11. The charging rates then are quite acceptable at about 2.2 so that seems to work well. Another thing that other people talk about is can we leave it charged? In my experience unless the battery charger is going to go faulty then it isn't going to make much difference because the battery charger will cut out when the first cell reaches 4.2 volts and will only come back on again when it's dropped down significantly. And these lithium cells seem to hold their charge really well. So I don't think that leaving it on charge is going to be a problem unless, as I say, your charge is faulty. And I'm sure you won't find that with a genuine Dyson charger. Yeah, so it's been an interesting journey. Don't know where I'm going from here. Don't know whether I actually try this new board that I bought or whether I'm too frightened of it uh, giving way, causing a fire. Uh, so I'll have to see about that. It has, in fact, as I say, just got two FETs here, N-channel FETs, and a P-channel FET here and then it's microcontroller down the end. There's a lot of individual circuitry, quite a few transistors I think. Uh, there's a resistor here, I assume is a very low resistor for measuring the current that the thing is actually consuming. But it has no proper battery management control system like on the Dyson model. Yeah, so that's more or less it. I think that'll do for now. That's where I'm at. And so it's bye now. Bye.